Hello, real estate investors. Welcome to the George Gammon Real Estate Investing Show. Once a week, every Saturday, where I review the past week in the news or in macroeconomics to give you my insights as to what happened and some information that you can use to make better investment decisions. So let's dive right into it here. The first thing that I wanted to discuss is the Federal Reserve goes dovish. And for those of you who don't know what that means, and if you're in the real estate game, you absolutely 100% should know what that means. The Fed taking a dovish tone means that they are going to get looser with monetary policy, meaning lowering interest rates. If they go hawkish, that means that they're going to potentially go on an uh, on an interest rate cycle where they increase interest rates over a period of time, making money harder to, or making lending harder and reducing the amount of credit that's in the system. And typically that is uh, bullish for the dollar. If interest rates are going up, generally that's going to increase the purchasing power of the dollar relative to other currencies. If the Fed is dovish, like they are in this case, they're potentially talking about lowering interest rates. And last I checked, the market has a 100% probability of the Fed lowering interest rates this year. That is very bullish for the dollar. That's the main thing that I wanted to address here in our first topic of news. And I pulled this up on <clears throat> the Financial Times where Jerome Powell, who is the Fed chairman, went in front of uh, the Congress which as we all know is a complete joke and it's more for theatrics than it is for real intellectual questions or debate. But um, you, can get, you can get a very good read often on the mindset of the Federal Reserve in these discussions, if you want to call it that, and to get an idea of, of where they're thinking the interest rates will be headed in the short term and potentially the midterm. And why that's important for real estate investors, again, because that has a tailwind or a headwind. It's not a 100% probability, but it's a headwind or a tailwind for the dollar. And they're talking about moving short-term interest rates, which often affects the long-term interest rates and as we know, the 10-year interest rate or the, the yield that, it, that um, the yield on the 10-year bond or the 10-year treasury, meaning the debt of the United States, that's what mortgage rates are based on. So we as real estate investors always want to pay attention to the 10-year treasury yield, the interest rate on the 10-year treasury yield yield because that is going to show us where mortgage rates are. So that said, if the Fed is lowering the short-term interest rates, and if that has an effect on the 10-year, that means the interest rate on the 10-year could potentially go down. That means lowering interest rates. I do want to say that typically lower interest rates would be quite a tailwind for housing prices, but in today's conditions, I'm not so sure. The reason is we have been in a, what they call ZIRP, Z-I-R-P, or an acronym for 0% interest rate policy for almost 12 years. It is true that the Fed has gone on a tightening cycle where they have been tightening rates for the last year and a half or two years. But prior to that, we were at 0% interest rates for almost a decade. And what that means is when interest rates go that low, that pulls the future demand into the present. That's one of the reasons that the Federal Reserve does this when the economy is going or potentially going into a recession. And they want to, uh, most Keynesian economists 
and that's the, the majority of them out there, feel as though a recession is caused by a lack of demand. So if they reach into the future and grab that demand, pull it into the present, that's going to smooth out a recession. Now, we can debate whether or not that is true, but that's their goal. I would give them, I would give it to them that lowering interest rates definitely does pull demand into the present. And my argument now would be that they have, especially in housing, that they've pulled so much demand into the present or now the past that even if you go back to 0% interest rates, how much more demand is out there from people who haven't purchased a home? I know there is there are a lot of millennials that are standing on the sidelines because they cannot afford to buy their first home, but lowering interest rates, does that bring them into the market? Maybe, maybe not. It does lower the monthly payments, but if the prices of homes are too high or out of reach, even with a monthly payment at a 0% interest rate, and again, that's the overnight rate, the mortgage rates at a 0% overnight rate would be, let's say, 3 to 4%, something like that. But even at those low interest rates, can the millennials afford those monthly payments? I don't know. My, my guess would be not too many of them. So I don't think that this will really pull demand or that much more demand forward if they do drop the rates substantially. And what that means for real estate is I think it will definitely be a tailwind, but I don't think it'll be just a massive boom to real estate like lowering those interest rates down to zero was back in uh, 2012, 2013, 14. All right, let's move on here. The next topic of discussion that I found interesting this past week was the cyclical markets look weak. What is a cyclical market? That is a real estate market in the United States that has a tendency of going uh, way up and way down, boom bust. So that would be your Los Angeles, that would be your New York, Miami, uh, Seattle, more recently, Portland would fall into that category. These are markets where, again, there's a lot of appreciation, but if things go bad, they go really bad. Compared to a linear market, and that would, I would categorize Kansas City, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Memphis, this, Atlanta is kind of in the middle. Uh, but those are, are markets that really don't go way, way up or way, way down. They just kind of smooth, slow, and steady. Now, they do have their ups and downs. We can see that in the last downturn in 2009, 2010, 11. But they just don't go up and down as much on a percentage basis as those cyclical markets. So I have read a couple articles stating that these cyclical markets are starting to weaken. Right here, I've got an article on Yahoo Finance where they're talking about the high-end market in Manhattan, that it's actually fallen in Q2 5% from the comps last year. And although obviously the prices are still very high, they're starting to go down. And I thought that was interesting because it for me, reiterates the importance of if you're if you're going into this game for to preserve capital and to get a just a cash flowing solid return, stay away from these markets because there's a lot of downside. What I suggest doing is going into the more linear markets and getting or trying to buy for under the cost of construction on a starter home. Is that a 100% guarantee that you will not lose equity? Absolutely not. But you're just limiting your downside. And if you've got to invest right now in the United States, if you have to buy dollar denominated real estate, that's a good way to look at it. Go into a linear market, try to find a starter home that you can buy under the cost of construction. We'll address that a little more later on in the video. Let's go ahead and move on to the next topic that I wanted to discuss. 
and that is that construction or the cost of new construction is going up. And I don't need a news article to tell me this because I've actually built new homes in the United States. And as recently as 2014, back then my cost to build, now this is excluding land permits, this is just the cost to build the actual house itself, was right around 120 to 130 a square foot. And I know several guys who are builder developers back in the United States, and they have told me that their costs have not have now gone up to $150 a square foot at least, which is confirmed by this uh, quick Google search that I did, and I pulled this up. And why this is important, again, going back to the benefit of going into a, a more linear market is if you can buy something under the cost of construction, you're basically going into a situation where as long as the population isn't decreasing, like a Detroit, that's a whole other topic of discussion, but as long as the population isn't increasing, or excuse me, decreasing, you are never gonna have more supply hit the market than what you have right now. So if you own a starter home in Kansas City, let's say, that's 1,200 square feet, and you bought it for 150,000, there's never gonna be more supply of what you just bought come onto the market. There's never gonna be new supply of what you just bought hit the market unless prices go up meaning you make money. So I wanted to point that out, and I've said that quite a few times in some Facebook groups that I'm a part of, but I wanted to reiterate that here this week on the show, that, tr that the, the cost of construction now is upwards of 150 per square foot. So when you're doing the math and you're looking at properties out there, instead of using 120 or 130, a square foot like I used to back in 2014, 15. Now you got to ratchet that up to 150 a square foot. Kind of an interesting side topic that uh, I thought about this week is the popularity of electric scooters. And you can say, well, George, what on earth does that have to do with real estate? But I think in a weird way, it has a lot to do with real estate in that cities and the way people live, that whole dynamic is changing quite rapidly. You've got the younger generation coming up. They are not as fanatical about cars as my generation. I'm 46 years old, born in 1973. So when I was growing up, you know, every single kid or every single guy, you know, had a picture poster of the Lamborghini or the Ferrari or the DeLorean. And um, that was just what you aspired to uh, achieve, you know, sports cars. And it was just, cars were just uh, a really big part of growing up. And that was a, a big part of, of, uh, of, you know, what you wanted to have if, materially speaking. And I don't think that the younger generation is that fixated on automobiles anymore. Hence Uber and Lyft. And I think this is just the next step with these scooters where the kids coming along, you know, they don't have a need for a driver's license. They don't have a need for owning a car when they get uh, to be 16 years old. And because real estate prices are going so high and because housing is becoming so unaffordable, for a lot of these younger kids, especially with just astronomical student debt, I think this is gonna be kind of the release valve where they're gonna to start to move into the cities, more uh, uh, condensed urban areas where they might be able to rent an apartment, but maybe they just rent a room in an apartment. Uh, they, you know, they're squeezed financially, so they might not be able to afford $2,000 a month in rent, but maybe if they rent a couch or they rent, uh, you know, maybe they start building apartments that are far more com uh, compartmentalized like they are in Europe where you could get, or even in Medellin where you could get uh, a 700 square foot apartment and it might have 
three bedrooms or who knows, maybe even four. So there, I, my prediction is that they're going to be doing a lot more with a lot less. And I think the canary in the coal mine uh, coal mine, if you will, are these uh, are the popularity of these electric scooters. And I just did a quick uh, Google search here, as you can see. I mean, I can move my, my face here, but we've got uh, you know tons of article e scooters. They're actually causing a lot of accidents, as you can see. But look at this: when a scooter makes more sense than a car, go on scoot. Scooter giant Bird, I'm assuming that's the name of the, the rental company, will announce its official launch in Canada. Upstart, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but another Upstart scooter rental company. New York to legalize controversial e-bikes and scooters. Uber wants to fast forward to cities of the future. And it talks about, it gives an example of a lady and her husband who take electric scooters back and forth to Whole Foods in Uptown. So I just wanted to point out this trend. And what really kind of got me thinking about it was I'm in Medellin right now, and the traffic is bad, and I've got four remodel projects all within about a kilometer uh, of where I live, kind of a kilometer radius. And taking a cab, it's just a little bit much, and it's uphill. So for a lot of my workers, walking kind of isn't really a, an option. So I bought some of these electric scooters, and they, I tell you, I, they, they're awesome. They really are. They work fantastic. And I just think that we as real estate investors need to kind of see where the puck is going and not where it is right now to, to steal that Wayne Gretzky quote. And if the cities are becoming more condensed and if cars are, they're being less uh, of a need or demand for cars and more of a demand for these scooters, what does that mean for real estate coming in from the suburbs, maybe more condensed into urban areas? Maybe there's a way that uh, if you're a developer or maybe you go into a, an urban area where uh, you know, you buy a house and instead of flipping that house, you turn that house into five or six bedrooms and start renting out each bedroom on Airbnb because of this demand. And because the scooters are kind of a reflection of where the millennial mind is from a housing standpoint. So again, just an idea to, to mull over for real estate investors. And lastly, I wanted to go over the price of oil because, as we know, oil is denominated in dollars. So typically, typically, when oil is going up, the dollar is going down, and that is against a basket of currencies or sometimes against, oil, uh, against gold. And I do a lot of investing overseas. Recently, I've been doing a lot in Medellin, Colombia, and I wanted to touch on this because the uh, value of the peso relative to the dollar depends quite heavily on the price of oil because it's a big percentage of the GDP in Colombia. So going back to the Fed and its dovish tone this week with Jerome Powell in his uh, con congressional hearings, I guess you want to call them. It's just such a joke. I hate even calling him that. But uh, with what he did with his testimonies in front of Congress, being dovish, the way the market perceived that, I think that was really the catalyst to shoot oil up. So that makes the peso appreciate or gives it a lot of tailwind. So why I wanted to end on this is because if you are under the assumption that the Fed is going to remain dovish if they are going to lower interest rates. If that's your base case, then you should assume that the dollar will have some serious headwinds. I'm not saying that it will go down for sure, but it's going to have more headwind than it's had in the past couple years. And how that affects your portfolio or how you will allow that to affect your portfolio 
is entirely up to you, but you need to be cognizant of that. What I do with my portfolio, because I'm under the opinion that the Fed will become more dovish, that they will try to increase inflation because the national debt is so, is so high. And the only way that they're going to be able to get out of that mountain of debt, they meaning the federal government in the United States, is to inflate it away, which is very dollar negative. So what I do, because I have dollar assets in rental properties and I have dollar cash flow coming in from those rental properties, I like to diversify my real estate portfolio and have rental properties buy and hold in other countries where uh, the assets are denominated in different cur currencies to hedge my bets. So if the dollar is going up, I'm making mo money on my, or I'm, make, I'm, I'm increasing my purchasing power with those dollar denominated assets. And if the dollar is going down, then I'm increasing my purchasing power with the assets that I have and the cash flow that's denominated in a different asset. So that's where I'll end it. If you guys have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments below. Go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. These uh, shows will be coming out every Saturday where I'll review and go over what I thought was interesting from the week prior as it, to, as it pertains to real estate investing. All right, guys, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you soon.